Jenny, are you recording? Yep, we are recording now. And again, thank you all for being here. Um, this is Criticism Inside Alternatives Alongside Organizing Otherwise to Intervene in Anthropology's Futures. It is a 10-part webinar series being sponsored by the Wenner-Wren Foundation for Anthropological Research and the UC Irvine School of Social Sciences. Thanks for being here. I'm Bill Maurer. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Sciences at UC Irvine and a professor here in the Department of Anthropology. And I'm very pleased to welcome you. Again, there is captioning available should you require or desire. Um, and also we're recording. And if you have questions along the way, please enter them into the Q&A field at the bottom and our moderators whom I'll introduce in a second will help field those. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it right over to Taylor Nels. Hi everybody, thanks so much for joining us again. Um, I know there's nothing else going on this week, so really appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend with us on a beautiful Friday morning. Um, as Bill said, I'm Taylor Nelms. I'm the Senior Director of Research at the Filene Research Institute um, and uh, the anthropologist by training. Um, last time Bill and I talked um, two weeks ago, you know, we kind of laid the foundation, we hope, for this webinar series. We talked a little bit about how the precarization of knowledge production had changed what's possible and what's expected of um, public scholarship and scholar activism. We talked about um, some of the anxieties around the relevance of social science today and how that might be a little bit of a red herring in the face of what we see as a real renaissance in public scholarship. You know, we talked about the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to refuse any sense of a kind of great divide between academia and its altars and what an anthropology of fellow travelers or as one of the participants in the webinars put it, fellow troublers um, might look like. Uh, we talked about what the alternative in ALTAC means. Um, and we talked about the intervention as a kind of primary form or practice of, of public scholarship. Um, today, we're thrilled to be jo joined by Dr. Joan Donovan. Joan is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard. Um, and she leads the technology and social change project there. Among the really important, exciting kind of public um, and scholarly outputs that Joan oversees there at the Shorenstein, Shorenstein Center include the Media Manipulation Casebook, the Meme War Weekly Newsletter, it's a mouthful, and a webinar series called Big If True. Um, as a scholar, Joan is a leading thinker and researcher on the internet and on new digital technologies, especially as they intersect with the effects of online extremism, media manipulation, and disinformation campaigns, um, and the effects of those on, on public culture, conversation, and, and democracy itself. In the words of Farad Manju in the New York Times recently, uh, the way that activists, extremists, and propagandists surf currents in our fragmented, poorly moderated media ecosystem to gain attention and influence society. She's way too important to have a conversation with Bill and I, but we're really excited that she's here anyway. Um, and later on, uh, we'll be joined by three PhD students. Um, Bill, do you wanna introduce them? Sure. Uh, so the way this will go is Taylor and I will have a conversation with Joan for a half an hour or 40 minutes or so. And then we'll be joined by three PhD students who are here with us. Kim Fernandez from the University of Pennsylvania, recently crowned PhD candidate, congratulations, Kim. Nina Medvedeva from the University of Minnesota, and Nima Yolmo from the University of California at Irvine. And so after a bit of back and forth with me and Taylor and Joan, um, those three will jump in and carry the conversation forward with their own questions, as well as questions that, that you who are joining us today post in the Q&A chat. And again, I just want to acknowledge um, the support of the Wenner Wren Foundation for this series, as well as uh, UC Irvine. And with that, why don't we kick it off. And we should warn you that Joan has sound effects, so that might happen here and there. What? <laughs> what? Come on. You don't talk to someone that studies a a manipulation and not get a few, you know. You know, I mean, come on. I feel like I got that's a new the sound toy. effect of the week. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's like election night. Uh, you know. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, that's the last time I'll do it. Okay, <laughs> you, can, you can bring you can bring it back if you need to. So, Joan, we want to just start like in really broad brushstrokes. Tell us about your work. Tell us about your scholarship. Um, how it engages the public. Um, how you ended up at the Shorenstein Center, and like what does a day in the life of Joan Donovan look like? 
Um, so <laughs> goodness, uh, it's a lot. Uh, how did I end up where I am? Uh, it's a long and labored question about why UCI never offered me a job, I think. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, but uh, I do, I do love the folks out at UCI and so happy to be in conversation with you all. And that's where I originally had met Taylor um, and Bill is when I was way back in uh, the days of being at UC San Diego, PhD student in science studies and uh, sociology. And so I uh, kind of worked my way through the UC system as a postdoc at UCLA, uh, where I was dealing with um, white supremacist use of DNA ancestry tests. But I've always really cared about how people get information and then use it to change the world, right? That is just my big picture question. It's the thing that has always drawn me to questions about information distribution, the, the study of boring things, as Susan Lee Starr has put it, you know, infrastructure is something that I care deeply about. Um, telephones, right? Like I'm just a nerd about how people connect with one another. Uh, especially like looking at the history of telephones and phone freaking and pranking. And so all of these things have, have kind of come together in a weird way um, where there was this very strange job call out of data and society. And, and um, Dana just kind of pushed it in my inbox and was like, you know, interested. And I was like, Oh, you know, I'll put in an application because I'm putting in an application 80 other places, right? And, and this is back you know, this in is, uh, this is data 20, and society. Data and of, society, yeah, in 2016. Uh, and tell us what data and society is. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a research institute nonprofit in um, in New York City, uh, but they had this really interesting program going around media manipulation and studying how. Uh, information integrity and how people get information is uh, basically open. Uh, in, in our open information environment has made it so that media manipulators are more able to move bad information at scale. And Alice Marwick had been uh, really leading up this team that had some fantastic scholars on it, including uh, Becca Lewis, who's uh, someone who I've really uh, adored the scholarship of over the last few years. Um, anyway, I got the job. It was awesome. And I was able to work with some of the most interesting scholars that I had really, uh, you know, didn't really think about, you know, what it would be to, to run a research team and have like massive collaborations with bunches of people that I respect, but it was, it was a really nice job in the sense that I was able to do the kind of scholarship that I wanted on topics that mattered. And we pumped out a ton of research about advertising infrastructure, about white supremacist use of YouTube. Uh, we looked at uh, the problem of, you know, the quote unquote fake news problem uh, and how different imposters were showing up online and and using uh, the affordances of the internet, I was able to collaborate with Amelia Acker on a, on a paper about data craft and sort of the ways in which uh, it's not just the social part of manipulation that's interesting to me. It's really about how our technical systems are built in a way that has these affordances that usually manipulators and disinformers utilize in order to push uh, their political agendas forward. So that's, uh, all of that led up to um, an opportunity with the Shorenstein Center to lead up similar research, but also uh, expand beyond just media manipulation to look at uh, what we do now, which is what we call the Technology and Social Change Research Project, where we're looking at not just misinformation and disinformation, but also communication communication infrastructure and trying to get a sense of, well, how are manipulators turning our communication infrastructure to their advantage? And what are the roles of media and political elites in this process? And ultimately, I think our research right now is starting to look more at, well, who are really paying the true costs of misinformation? Journalists, civil society, public health professionals, researchers, why is, you know, why, why are so many folks having to deal with this problem of misinformation at scale? Uh, and so that's, 
that's really how I ended up here. Um, if not for the good fortune of just having met some of the right people at the right time that wanted to see the work that I wanted to do succeed. Joan, when you think of back to, you know, the, the first opportunities that you had to kind of engage in a real public way through your scholarship, right? Um, obviously, you know, your background, your first, you know, some of your first projects were on activist social movements. Um, you started to do work while at UCLA at, on white supremacist movements. Tell me a little bit about like what was the impetus or how did you first start to think about the potential impacts of your scholarship in the public domain? Yeah, um, when I first started doing research on activist communication networks during Occupy, you know, it's 2011 and something really strange is happening in the US. And I'm like, all other graduate students grasping for a project. I had just had, um, you know, I just uh, was like in the midst of writing my proposal, it wasn't really coming together. I was very interested at that time in medical sociology uh, and looking at uh, the ways in which stigma impacts how people understand mental illness. And that has always been a constant concern for me as I, I care deeply about the ways that people are able to access mental health care. And so that was really what I wanted to focus on in my dissertation. But uh, some of the medical sociologists at UCSD had, had gone on to uh, different gigs. And so I was like kind of looking for a project that I could do that uh, still resonated with me deeply, but also um, was a little bit more pragmatic in the sense that I could get, you know, the kind of mentorship that I needed. And in doing that, I actually found myself working a lot with Martha Lamplin, who's an anthropologist who had kind of found an uncomfortable home <laughs> at, in a sociology department. And um, she just really encouraged me to explore the things I wanted to look at. And so when the Occupy movement started happening in LA, uh, I just kind of went around as an observer, pretending as if I was uh, an anthropologist, just listening, learning, recording, doing field notes, thinking, you know, this is good practice for uh, if I want to study things that have this um, component of, you know, uh, dense online communication and then people actually changing their behaviors in public space. And so uh, through that time, that like 90 days that uh, the Occupy movement was really like tethered to public space, I was just a constant fixture trying to understand things, um, which actually brought some weird media opportunities my way. I was on NPR, I was in uh, the LA Times and, and I was in Fast Company, I think. Um, and it was because not a lot of people that were studying this um, were thinking more abstractly about the bigger impact that the, the events are gonna have on the way we conduct communication and the way in which it's gonna impact either local policy or um, uh, you know more public strategies about debt. And so that moment, um, was uncomfortable as a scholar because uh, I think I just didn't really know what to talk about to talk about with journalists. I knew what to talk about with my geek friends, which is like, isn't this technology cool and look what it can do. And why are we returning to the telephone in a movement when we have all of these affordances of social media? Um, you know, social media is branding itself as going to be this big breakout liberation technology, but we actually are like organizing on conference calls. Like, isn't that weird, right? Uh, but public scholarship wise, um, I've always been attracted to questions that um, are of important, you know, social consequence. And so when I had the opportunity to do research with Aaron Panofsky and Chris Kelty at, at UCLA, I, you know, I remember very clearly we're sitting around the, the cafeteria and we're talking about, well, what are we going to do together? And Aaron's like, you know, I've been looking at these posts from these white supremacists and there's something here about the way they're talking about DNA. And I'm like, well, there's something here because 
they seem to be mobilizing in a different way around science than we've seen in the past because they're negotiating questions about identity and you know purity and at the same time you start to see uh trump like rising to power uh as someone who's uh this like unlikely catalyst for these groups and so that research i'll 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 shut up in a second but that research that we did in uh at ucla in 20 2015 gets published uh the the asa the american sociological association conference is happening on the same weekend as the unite the right rally so we put out a preprint like all good nerds do before our presentation and that paper that we had written about white supremacist use of dna ancestry tests becomes this um way of seeing that community in that moment as people are trying to reckon with well what just happened in charlottesville and so that paper even though it had been rejected by the american journal of sociology i mean you know reviewer too <laughs> right uh even though we had you know gotten some revise and resubmits and things we we're still struggling with how to make sense of white supremacy and white supremacists at the same time society uh wanted to reckon with that question and i realized that you can't play around uh with the media they're going to quote you right and so you have to be really succinct you have to be really matter of fact and um and you have to get your point across in 15 words or less. And so I was just really careful with what I was willing to say in the public. And as a result of that, and then the work that I've subsequently done on how journalists get hoaxed um, has brought me deep into a community of journalists, which um, some of which I think, you know, are just brilliant, brilliant uh, writers and, and investigators. And, and so now I'm, you know, fully enmeshed in the worlds in the workaday worlds of journalists. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't through academia that that came about. It was just a series of coincidences and and yeah. It, it really strikes me that your interest in media and obviously there's a sort of abiding concern with communication and communication technology. But in the role of media, right, in framing up the kinds of public debates we can have um, and the ways that information then flows, you know, around through social networks or, you know, public conversations generally, that comes out of your personal experience in trying to communicate other kinds of scholarly insights in and through media contacts. Yeah, definitely. And and that's and that's what's hard, I think. I, you know, I really looked a lot to the work of Biela Coleman in that moment around how does what you study help you become a good translator for those communities uh into, you know, language that everybody, you know, primarily can understand and 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 in venues that people are used to accessing, right? I think that the other like weird thing about having a preprint, you know, turn into a bunch of uh, news articles. And I think, you know, I think Aaron counted them at one point. There were over a hundred articles written about our, our paper is that, um, you know, you don't want to be presenting research that hasn't been peer reviewed and vetted. Uh, on a public stage like that because you do you know you really deeply value the community of colleagues that are willing to read your work and tell you you're wrong and i think right now in this field with media manipulation and disinformation you have hucksters and hoaxers and grifters posing as disinformation experts i mean that this field is definitely much more treacherous than what we were dealing with in 2016 around um, just, you know, being people who were willing to talk about uh, white supremacist communities online and what their form and function looked like. Now, I'm often really perplexed by, you know, some of the ways in which disinformation has taken a main stage in our public debates without conversations about the roles of political elites and media moguls and the consolidation of information through platforms. Um, whereas some of the people that, you know, 
end up becoming considered disinformation experts have much less of a commitment to uh, the academic rigor as well as the, the, the sort of commitments that we have as scholars to uh, getting at some of these tougher questions about, well, who really benefits from disinformation at scale and, and, you know, who really benefits from allowing uh, advertising online to work the way that it does, which essentially, you know, Siva Vadarathian really shows it in his book, Anti-Social Media, says, you know, this is basically an ATM machine, right? <laughs> that's, that's what they've built. And so, uh, you know, I think as we weather 2020 and, you know, disinformation has played a huge role in how we understand our politics, I often wonder, you know, the commitments to public scholarship and the and how that gets you wrapped up in some of the other more thorny, thorny issues about power and uh, information control. That's a really good transition, Joan, I think, to a set of questions that we have about, you know, the role of public scholarship in, in kind of making a difference, right? So, you know, if you think about your own work, you know, and specifically the work that you do right now, right? So your, your day job, right? At the Shorenstein Center in the Technology and Social Change Project. What's your, you know, maybe it's implicit, but maybe help us make it explicit. What's your kind of theory of change for the work that you do, right? So like, how do you imagine in an ideal, you know, way that it might have an impact, right? And maybe, maybe one way to ask this question is, you know, who's the audience for the work that you and your colleagues do or audience is, and what kind of change do you expect your work to make? Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm in a research director position at the Harvard Kennedy School, right? So policy is a huge focus of the school and is something that I've really kind of had to like fall backwards into in a way because I don't I didn't you know I, it, you know there's an imp implicit like you know does sociologists lead does good sociology lead to good policy and I think the jury's probably out on that <laughs> but um you know so for us as a team and you know I'll speak about my team and Shorenstein in particular Shorenstein's always been really known as a fellows place and as a place where um, you know, that people come at sort of mid towards the end of their career and they'll write a retrospective paper about what it was like to be a governor, or what it was like to be a mayor, or what it was like to, you know, be this, the, you know, editor in chief of PBS or something. Um, and so we really tried to turn Shorenstein around into a more research focused center. And I think what that means in terms of public scholar, public impact of our work is that, yeah, I mean, like the, being at Harvard makes a huge difference because um, people take what comes out of Harvard as, you know, very, very seriously. And so you have to act, you have to bring to that a kind of rigor and clarity of purpose that I think my team you know, really cares a lot about information integrity in the public sphere. We care a lot about accurate information, especially during the pandemic. Um, you know, when I was at UCLA and in the Institute for Society and Genetics, we talked a lot about, you know, negotiations between science and scientists around like, when do they become public figures? When do you step out and say, you know, everybody thinks it's like this, but that's actually political spin and, and what's really going on is, is this other thing. And so for us, um, we take up as our audience, um, you know, not necessarily other researchers, but we think about policymakers, can, can this research be useful to them? And so we engage quite a bit with uh, policy-minded folks. Uh, and in some instances, I've testified in front of Congress, which is a torture unlike no other. It's like cramming for your dissertation defense when you've never met your committee, 
right? And so you don't know how things are going to hit. You know, you say the word democracy and a few of them are like, wait, what's that? <laughs> you know, or like, what do you mean by that? Or you say, you know, we need to have more content moderation because, you know, the white supremacists are really able to, to, to make their conspiracy theories stick. And, and they're like, wait, we don't, we don't want any moderation at all. We don't think government should be in the business of information. And then you're like, oh, okay. So, you know, that audience is a tough one because I think I know, I know that it matters that they understand what we're doing, but it might not be their priority to understand what we're doing. And so we have to do, we have to work extra hard to make sure they see it and understand it. Then we're also very interested in understanding how technologists see and make sense of this problem. Uh, you know, I've been hanging out long enough in California to know that there is a kind of ethic and approach to technology in California that is like no other in the sense that people are drawn to building things without being pragmatic about the plan for how that technology might um, not necessarily be full of all the good things you've pitched your, your VCs on. Um, and so there's always these uh, strategic blind spots in technological innovation and development that there's been so much great scholarship on uh, lately, especially, of course, the work of uh, Sophia Noble and Sarah Roberts at UCLA. Um, so in that sense, technologists have to read and understand our work and know where it applies. And so that's been difficult, uh, just making sure that they get it. And now they get the hate speech problem, uh, which is in, in 2016, 2017, they would say to me, well, I, I, that's not a behavior. I can't, I can't make a difference here uh, because that's just content and we don't touch content. We look at behaviors and we, you know, the algorithm serves things based on people's behaviors. And so we've really had to put algorithms at the center of the debate about what technology does, because that is really about how it serves people information. Uh, journalists have been um, something that uh, a group that have been probably most receptive to our research not only just writing about it, but being the subjects of it. And so they are very much uh, folks that we will send, you know, drafts to and say, does this resonate with your experience? Um, and journalists are very quick to take up any kind of tip sheet or any kind of advice you want to give them. They're really receptive to changing um, their approach if you can convince them. <laughs> that the approach uh, is changed. And there's a bit of a generational divide now in newsrooms. I was watching a great um, Knight Foundation podcast or um, webinar yesterday about this very thing where uh, the standards of journalism and especially around, you know, what we might call both, both sides coverage, um, that's now up for debate. That's no longer uh, really industry standard. And that problem is manifesting in the workplace where some people who've been trained in this, you got to go to the source, you got to ask both sides are now being challenged by, well, what if the source is a white supremacist? Or what if the source is actually lying to you? Like, how do you talk about that, right? And so um, that question is something that our research is really as well as the research of many others, including First Draft News, um, has put on the table. And then lastly, a new is to me is the, the world of doctor, doctors and public health professionals who are, I mean, they're really afraid of how misinformation at scale is changing their practice and, and actually leading to the death of some of their patients who are, um, you know, refusing a vaccine that doesn't exist. They're not wearing masks because they're being told it's not important. Um, and that's showing up in the doctor's office. And so much of our work over the last two months has gone to looking at medical misinformation, working with um, folks at the WHO on understanding this problem and how it, man how it shows up globally. You know, Joan, I just wanna pick up on a couple of things that you said here. Um, with respect to the journalists on the one hand and the technologists on the other. Um, and this may be 
you know, I, I want to try to get to one of the chief challenges of your work, I think, which is that, um, you know, the, the one constituency, the journalist, is used to a mode of, of reporting based on fact checking, right? But, but that doesn't really work anymore. Or if it works, it's not believed because the journalists are seen as the kind of mouthpiece of elite perspectives that have been delegitimated by other elites um, in, in our society. Um, so the whole, you know, let's just get the correct information out there thing, right, clearly doesn't work. Um, so how do you work with them on that question? That, that's the first part. And the second part is, you know, you mentioned the, that you've sort of been working with the technology people to get them to really understand, you know, hey, your algorithm does stuff. Um, it's not just a neutral thing. Um, but then, you know, how do you get them to kind of shift their practices to, to really take on board some of the lessons of folks that you mentioned, like Sophia Noble, about the way that algorithms work to, you know, entrench existing inequalities and create new ones. These seem, these seem to go right at the core of the work that journalists and technologists do, and also at the core of kind of their self-identity, who they think they are. Um, so I wonder if you could just sort of reflect on, you know, in your work, how you're dealing with that, that really difficult problem, right? You're, you're confronting, in some ways, the very foundation of the professional identities of journalists and, and computer scientists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it's a question, you know, I'm not the, obviously not the only person dealing with this. I think, you know, Mary Gray's work, um, or her book, Ghost Work, um, is really influential in the sense that it helps us understand that there are human beings all uh, enmeshed in this. And this goes back to some of my work on telephones, where I was really obsessed with all of the pictures of female telephone operators who had to have arms of a certain length so that they could plug into the boards and they, you know, AT&T preferred if you were unmarried so that you could have, you know, more time to, to be at work. And, and so there are kinds of laborers and there are kinds of different kinds of infrastructural work where, um, you know, there are some folks in my field who like really, really focus in on C-suite you know, the suit and tie executives and like try to get close to power as if, you know, if you could just convince Mark Zuckerberg that there was a problem, then maybe things would change. Our work really tries to go get at folks that are doing the work, right? To, to reveal to them something deeper about the work that they're carrying out daily that will help them do their job better. And most people are fairly receptive to that if you don't dismiss exactly what it is that they're trying to do and the social conditions that got them there and the kinds of um uh everybody plays these games in their in their offices right but like how do you get that person that is now attuned to what's happening how do you get them to start telling their other coworkers, yeah well if we do this then this actually is what happens and um and so that's been that's been rewarding in the sense that with, at least with the technologists and journalists, as I try to meet them where they are, I've been brought into these different companies to talk to people that work there, been brought into different newsrooms to talk to uh, staff and just, you know, and then when they ask me questions, I answer them honestly, which is, you know, if I don't know, I say I don't know. But by and large, the kinds of questions that I get from the people in these professions is really about what is the role that social media is playing that is different from before, right? They don't always understand. I think this is where academics really shine is that we can take a step back and see a bit of the connections between order and power, like the way that Chris Kelty writes about moral and technical order and how when you're building a technology, you actually have an idea about how you're going to sell it and who the market's going to be and what the users are supposed to be like and what the purpose is. And, and those, those building blocks uh, also apply to journalists in the sense that when they write a story, they don't want to miss a big part of the story. They don't want to be embarrassed and publish something and be told, Hey, you, mi you missed the mark here. And so, you know, you, it, if you can give them frameworks for understanding questions they can ask that help them 
uh, get to the bottom of these things in their practice, it, it does help. Um, our media manipulation casebook, for instance, um, we just launched this this week, but I've been going around and giving this this talk in different places about the life cycle of media manipulation campaigns. And it's basically about, you know, if you look at these five different points of action for any media manipulation campaign, you can really make sense of it quickly. And then you can actually assess if you really need to report on it or do something about it, which is to say that most media manipulation campaigns fail uh, because nobody responds, nobody newsworthy responds. So the first two stages are, uh, uh, planting in, in the origins of the campaign. Usually there's a breaking news opportunity and you see media manipulators kind of rush in and they have a plan of attack. Maybe they have a viral slogan or a hashtag they want to use. Like yesterday, it was all about the hashtag stop the steal. Uh, and then from there, you know, when people react, journalists started writing about this Hashtag saying that it was full of misinformation. It, there were some calls to violence. Platform companies then intervened, like uh, Facebook removed um, an, a, a page, a, a group page that had like nearly 400,000 people in it. And then they removed a series of event pages. So that's stage three is like, who's responding? What are the mitigation efforts around stage four? Like what are platforms doing? And then the last stage is the adaptations by the manipulators. And so that's what we're going to be watching for today. But that framework actually works across these different professions uh, as, a, as a rubric for, well, should I do something? Uh, and I think that that's what's, that's what's at stake. You know, years ago, Lana Schwartz said to me, you know, like about this kind of research and about research on the net is really like, you have to train your attention to what matters in terms of what's scaling and how people are sort of inventing new uses. And so I've, you know, I've always kind of kept that advice uh, in the back of my mind, which is to say, like, there's going to be normal misinformation out there. There's going to be lots of like lies on the internet. That's not the point. The point is when it scales. The point is when people in power take it up and wield it. And so that's where um, our work, I think, can help bridge those gaps between journalists and technologists, uh, especially through the, the lens of misinformation. Great, thanks. Um, that's super helpful. And it also really is nice to, nice and scary that it's like right about what's happening today. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going we're gonna to transition now to the next um, part of our conversation where our panel of grad students are going to take it over and um, start posing some questions. And I'm gonna hand it over to Kim first, but for those who are watching and listening in, feel free to also drop some questions or comments in the Q&A field as well. Um, Kim? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for these really useful and sort of, I'm very, I'm sitting very much with the range of things you captured, uh, particularly in response to Taylor's question about your audience. And I was wondering if you would be able to say a little bit more uh, about your choice of method, uh, both in terms of how investigative digital ethnography has been influenced by anthropology, other areas, uh, and also what it means to, like how does your audience speak to your method and vice versa, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I am not a trained anthropologist, though I've shown up to the AAA a few times. Um, so I get I get the I get the the feel for it. Um, and from from my vantage point, one of my closest collaborators, Brian Friedberg, is 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 uh, trained in anthropology, cultural anthropology, and so we've really honed in on this method that we call digital investigative ethnography. Uh, and so there's a white paper up on our, on our website about it. And it blends the work of investigative journalists with uh, a more steady anthropological approach to being with these communities of manipulators and white supremacists for the long haul. And so uh, Brian and I have been, you know, watching this content develop over years. We've been sort of in the working everyday hour worlds of white supremacists and media manipulators and violent misogynists and online trolls. And so this work um, isn't without its 
vicarious trauma in the sense that like we often will be like, oh, oh yeah, I just saw something terrible today. And then, you know, we, we have to, we have to cope with that. Um, and so anthropologically, I think the, the um, ethnographic method is something that I've really over the years cared a lot about and, and cared to understand what communities are doing and how they think that, you know, that the other, the other part of the world is either working against them or working, you know, what's, what's been really revealing about studying these groups over time and actually, and also coming from having studied um, more um, uh, pro-social social movements is uh, that everybody feels like there's a, there's a, an ambiguous they that is trying to prevent them from uh, live in their best life. And the way in which they conceptualize that, the way in which different communities conceptualize the they leads to different forms of action in public space. And I can even consider, I will even consider uh, and, and say out loud that I consider the internet more broadly public space, but there's lots of carve outs and caveats, but things that happen online are just as important to me as things that happen in meat space or IRL or whatever kind of dichotomy you want to, to bring about. And um, Tom Bilsdorf's work on, um, you know, uh, digital spaces and like the idea that you're never not on your phone or never not online uh, is something that I, I often think about when, uh, and also T.L. Taylor's work as well, uh, when I think about like, what does it mean in this moment, you know, to have antisocial movements, right? Like people who are like against other people existing, uh, these people are mobilizing, they're showing up in uh, public space, they are not in the shadows like they were in 2015 uh, when I was studying white supremacists. And so we take that approach very seriously as, as researchers where we try to get as close to that action as we can, and then we try to translate it for publics uh, to understand what the... Um, the importance is of of um countering these groups right like you know countering vicious white supremacists like that kind of work um is something that's uh that's difficult to do uh and isn't always uh clear about like how research plays into that you know some journalists do this uh nonprofits do it but in terms of research for us, it's very cut and dry. It's like, did they say this? Where did they say this? Where did we see it show up in public space? And like, how do we draw those, the clearest lines possible to say, this group of people were planning this, they were using these uh, technologies, they were either hiding who they were or hiding what their intent was. And then it looks like this in public space and downstream of that, like how do we then counter some of that organizing and that messaging. Um, and that to me, like mostly is done in the work of, of a handoff in the sense that we do those re we do that research and then either the platform companies make a decision or civil society organizations take up the, the charge, like Change the Terms Coalition, for instance, has been using uh, lots and lots of research on white supremacists online to like create model policies for platform companies. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, it's, it's an approximation of an answer, <laughs> but methodologically, I mean, you, you gotta know, you gotta know where to look for these things. You gotta document them. Um, and you gotta cut out the hyperbole. I mean, that's the other thing is like, you really gotta understand, yeah, there are stakes to this, uh, but you have to like, you have to, you have to get at what you can know. And I think that that's the last thing I'll say is that, uh, this field of disinformation research, some some people run it as a cover to try to get massive amounts of data from platform companies to actually conduct other studies. Um, we don't use massive amounts of data. We're not uh, in in that world. We we do much more steady, uh, engaged research in the sense that like we'll watch several hundred hours of YouTube videos if that's going to help us make our reports better. 
And, um, you know, that's not a lot, that's not what a lot of other researchers are willing to commit to in order to try to make sense of this world. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was really helpful. I kind of have a related question and this relates to how for long your work has emphasized the need for responsibility and accountability in the design and also the maintenance of uh, systems that bring publics together, internet for one. Um, and you've also spoken at length about the importance of like the practices involved in journalism that evolved over time of ethics and protocols. So I was thinking of this in relation to um, instruction and pedagogy within the academia, particularly at this moment where we are like moving to like remote instructions. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how like the moment, like the renewed interest in the sense of how social scientists, uh, anthropologists and sociologists in particular could approach education and pedagogy with a public facing work in mind. Yeah, there's a great book called Design Justice by Sasha Costanza Chalk, uh, as well as Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology are two books that I often look to to think about, you know, how do you get people to understand that the research that they do can serve a broader public and what are those handoff points and um, and not just handoff points, but what are those touchstones? Like what are those places where you're asking for feedback or input or actually collaborating with, with uh, folks that are uh, gonna be impacted by the, either the technology that you build or, or the concepts that you bring into this world. And I know at UCI, Roderick Crooks has been leading a, a pretty significant effort around how do you like link together research and pedagogy uh, as well as uh, make it serve a broader public. And so at Harvard Kennedy School, I've had the really good fortune of being able to teach now two courses on media manipulation and disinformation. And I learn a ton from my students because a lot of people come into this work thinking, you know, um, thinking that it's hyper-partisan. And that has a lot to do with the fact that our media ecosystems are shaped really differently when we talk about center and left media versus when we talk about right wing or conservative media. And I'm not talking about far right, just talking about, you know, um, right wing. And the reason why I think it matters for us to understand research wise, why this might be a, a, a kind of like difficult zone for people to do education in is because you don't want to be saddled with partisan issues at the same time that you're trying to demonstrate concepts. You're trying to say, hey, this is how a certain kind of media manipulation tactic works. So even um, yesterday as one of my researchers, our senior editor, she doesn't like to be called a researcher, Emily Dreyfus, uh, who's the, you know, she, she works on our team helping us shape a lot of our research and, and getting to the bottom of things. Um, and uh, so she publishes in the New York Times a case study that we had been working on related to why Trump misspelled Biden crime family, right? And for us, like, it's not about Trump misspelling Biden crime family. It's actually the demonstration of a media manipulation tactic that's been going on for a long time, which is a kind of typo squatting, which is that Twitter had shut down Biden crime family as a search term. So if you search for the hashtag, you got zero results. And we were like, that's weird because these companies need to be more transparent about the content moderation that they take because otherwise it leaves manipulators open to say, hey, this is bias, this is hidden, this is secrecy, this is collusion, you know? Um, and so transparency actually has political implications for the rest of us. Um, but in seeing that Trump had spell, misspelled Biden crime family, most people would read it and say, okay, this guy misspelled something, you know. For us, that was a clue that there was something else going on. And we took that clue. And then we started to see that people were actually using the misspelled hashtag on other platforms that weren't even throttling or blocking search results of Biden crime family. And so for us, the story is about the tactic and the story is about the, the manipulation, but also Rob Ferris's work um, and you know, Rob Ferris and Yokai know, Binkler's work also point us to the fact that like these tactics tend to show up 
in the right wing media ecosystem more primarily. And so we try to balance uh, the way we do education with um, a healthy dose of understanding that this is going to get people into the realm of discussing partisan politic. But, um, you know, usually like most conservatives I know get it. <laughs> they understand that there's a pretty big propaganda campaign underway right now about voter fraud. And until we get evidence of voter fraud, the journalists are not going to cover it, um, you know, without solid evidence. Um, and so, yeah, when it comes to education about this, I think there's a deep fear about being labeled some kind of like social justice warrior partisan professor. And I think I might be in an advantage being at Harvard Kennedy School where, hey, my boss used to work for John Kerry and he's, he used to be the mayor of Newton, Massachusetts. And so he's a you know, he's a blue, he's a blue <laughs> Democrat. Um, and so people uh, understand that partisan politics doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you've got a political agenda, but you have to be really, really careful about how you explain it to people because you want them to understand the concept, uh, not necessarily just the like, the, um, the more scandalous part of the example. Hi, thank you for that. Um, so I guess just as a follow-up question, um, I'm kind of interested in the relationship between um, your research and the policy making that it inspires and sort of surveillance. And to kind of expand on that, um, so there are folks who are like in specifically anti-fascist groups or in more radical left like anarchist spheres who feel very comfortable actually going into sort of um, and to end encrypted loops or discords and finding out like who is it that's responsible for certain types of dialogues coming out and then they feel very comfortable making that information known and then trying to like ban people from those platforms. Um, and I was kind of wondering like how does your work negotiate sort of that tension and the sort of ways that you decide to focus on specific tactics or discuss um, certain actors like whether it's like, I don't know if you are going into these close to end time groups or if you're focusing more on the public facing side of things, but I was wondering how you are approaching that uh, relationship between research and I guess what I'm calling surveillance, so that might not be the right word for it. Yeah, so there's um, a, a, a rich literature uh, around anonymity and the internet and sort of the, the kind of ethic that gets us here. Um, and one of the ways in which we envisioned the net politic of anonymity playing out is that everybody would be anonymous. And over time with social media platforms being so closely wedded to people's social networks, that's become increasingly more and more difficult if you want to remain anonymous. The other thing about organizing online is if you are going to organize to manipulate some algorithms to get something to trend, you actually have to do it in public. You, you need a massive amount of people to make something happen. And, and we notice the same thing with networks of harassers or people that are trying to bring together white supremacist rallies is that for the most part, the organizing has to happen in public. The reason why we know something is a foreign operation and it's more difficult to track is if something just starts trending on Twitter and there's no ephemera in any places you can find online, um, that to us more than likely points to, you know, uh, some kind of boardroom decision where people are like, okay, this is the thing we're going to do and here's how we're going to do it. And usually that's, that was sort of uncovered in the um, research that people have done on the Russian IRA stuff is just to say they couldn't find any evidence of other identities of <laughs> groups doing this. And so, uh, and then once people got data from CrowdTangle about um, paying in rubles and like Russia being behind it, it all started to make sense. That being said, um, when it comes to, I, I think I wrote about this maybe for PBS or something about doxing. I wrote about it in, in Chris Kelty's Limb magazine as well about doxing used to be a technique to hold the powerful account to account. Um, and it could, it, it, a lot of the early doxing that we saw around anonymous, especially around like the, the hashtag operation pig roast or, 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 um, or op pig roast was about when police officers overstepped 
and either pepper sprayed people or arrested people in a very violent way, you would see a bunch of people kind of jump into action to get the name of that officer out into the public. We saw this actually with UC Davis and Officer Pike uh, with the, um, the pepper spraying cop incident. That technique, though, that we've seen uh, used time and time again to hold the powerful to account has been uh, just uh, individualized and made manifest that anybody can do this now, which actually introduces a new and potentially more dangerous situation for folks like me who grew up on the net, not really thinking a lot about what my personal information is going to look like and who's going to want it. Um, whereas younger folks, I think, are much more attuned to surveillance and the net and what that looks like. So I'm very thankful for all the education of groups like Media Justice are doing to make sure that young people know not to put your address online, not to put your phone number online, not, and in some instances, not even to use your real name. That being said, um, these white supremacist groups on you know, either Telegram or Discord or any of these chat apps people mess up. They use the same uh, avatar, they might use the same picture, and then it's tied to, you know, it's, and then, you know, there's a way of linking them back to their Facebook group or their Facebook page or linking them to their um, college if they like accidentally mention that they went to a, a football game the day before. And so there's all these things that are leave behind, these digital traces, these digital clues that, um, anti-fascist organizers are picking up on and, and then making it known, but also uh, investigative reporters are, are doing that work as well. But I do think that uh, the same kind of techniques are playing out where I, I just feel that a call from, from folks in, in, um, in uh, New Mexico about, you know, leftists getting doxxed and what can, what they, can they do to protect themselves? And I think from my vantage point, it's like, we do need to think about personal information online, what the leave behinds are and policy wise, there should be a way to get your information off the internet, uh, short of having to like, just sh take on a whole new name. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, the one funny story, I know we have to wrap up, but my, um, my uh, parents-in-law, they had their phone number was listed on Google as the local FedEx. And so they kept uh, the FedEx fax number. So uh, like six, seven times a day, they would get a fax phone call. And they were like, Joan, what do we do? And I was like, change your phone number. Like, you're not going to get Google to change this listing. And so we're actually at this point, I think this big inflection point in the internet where we need some norms um, you know, and I'm reminded of other industries like the airline industry, you know, the, the first few people to build the flying machine, you know, the real, the real harm was going to be if they crashed, right? Like they were going to get hurt. Uh, they didn't start by building an airport. And I think at this point, we do need some, some uh, plans and industries to start to be built up around internet and social media so that we can get access to timely, local, relevant, accurate information, but also that when information out, is out there about us that imperils us, that they, we should be able to take it down or to have it removed or to have some kind of process by which um, we can adjudicate these things. Because otherwise it's just gonna, it's always going to be the advantage of, of disinformers and media manipulators to use this open environment against uh, against, you know, the, the rest of us who are, you know, mostly just trying to avoid uh, any serious harm. Joan, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, we want to wrap up and we do have a question um, that has come in a couple of questions and, and unfortunately we won't be able to get to that. But I just wanted to, to sort of wrap up by saying, you know, it really strikes me. It's such a tough question for you and I'm sure that you have to sort of think about it kind of day in and day out about, you know, how to study efforts to undermine truth, right, to undermine confidence, right, in information, um, while also seeking to equip people and organizations and policymakers to combat those efforts with the tools of empirical social science, right? So there's this really kind of tough nut, right, to crack at the center of your work that I think is really important just to kind of emphasize as a, um, as a kind of takeaway for me. And it also strikes me some of the really critical kind of 
themes or sort of re recurring themes that that I've heard you talk about in, in over the course of this conversation, right? The importance of discomfort, I think has been really interesting to hear you talk about. Obviously the importance of coincidence or contingency or accident, right? In your own personal journey. Um, the other thing that I just want to point out that you do so well that all of us, that is really a model for all of us is how important it is for you to name the relationships that matter to you, right? So as we were talking about in our first conversation as we build out a kind of social science of fellow travelers, so important to maintain and make explicit the relationships that, that sustain and maintain us, right? So your, your ability to sort of weave in the named relationships that matter to you throughout this conversation has been so important. And I just wanna point that out for our listeners as well. And then of course, you know, what really critical, I think it, your skill at becoming an ethnographer of your audiences, right? Those with whom you hope to have an impact you know, part of the work you do, you may not ever write about it, but is to understand the ways that they operate, what motivates them, you know, what the best ways to sort of, you know, to, to build out a relationship or a sense of rapport with them so that your work can gain a foothold, right? Um, and so being an ethnographer of your, you know, intended audience, I think is such a really great lesson for all of us who are sort of seeking to make our way in, in public, public scholarship, the public domain. So, you know, those are some of the things that sort of really struck me listening to you throughout this conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. I know that we're at time. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, no applause line at the end um, of the conversation. There we go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do the laugh track. Oh, the laugh track, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there yeah, it yeah. is. Sorry, I had to do it. No, I really appreciate everybody um, staying on the line here and, and inviting me in. And I'm really sad that we can't be all together in the same in the same space, you know, um, hanging out and, and riffing on these issues. And I've been um, really the fortunate benefactor, I think, of of Bill's generosity, especially bringing me out to UCI. If, if I guess it's a few years ago now to talk mm -hmm. about, you know, white supremacy and free speech on campuses, and you know, students are. Uh, I think at the full, uh, at the center, we didn't talk a lot about this, but I think at the center of, of all of our work is a desire to educate, a desire to teach, a desire to help people understand things. And so that's really where, where um, I feel like this work really, really fits in. And I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, graduate students take up media manipulation and disinformation as dissertation topics. And I'm excited to see other folks try to understand how disinformation touches down in their communities, what kind of chaos and havoc does it cause. And, and I'm also really excited to think about digital public infrastructure and what the next iteration of the web is going to have to be given that uh, the experience or the experiment with social media is now uh, seems to be coming to a close. And with that, we'll bring things to a close. So Joan, thank you very much again for joining us. Um, this is the second of a 10 part series. Um, and so next time, I believe we'll have um, newly minted MacArthur Genius Mary Gray for Microsoft Research with us. So everyone, um, please come back and join us for that. Thanks, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you on the internet. See you in the virtual space. <laughs> Bye.